Well, it, uh, it's good to be here again. I, I want to just share with you, uh, again, one of those photographs. Uh, this is a, one of the coastline of Northern California. And I want you just to take a moment and, and look at, you know, in the morning, the fog starts to lift off the water and we're up on a bluff and there's mountains behind us and you can see to the left of this picture where there's the mountains are not quite as high the sun is making a much brighter light but where it's casting a shadow of the mountain that's directly behind Sherry when she took the picture the water in some places is almost black there where the waves are anyway I I can just look at these pictures I get the privilege of going through and getting to select those and put them on and I just so much appreciate the ministry that Sherry has for us uh, I hope you just can see yourself standing on a bluff and enjoying this uh, lovely picture so we are in the Gospel of John chapter 4 and we are in the second part I call this part 2 and you know we're going to pick up kind of where we left off in our last presentation on the Samaritans uh, but also more than that uh, I'm just going to say that uh, Mac is in the studio with a little piece of his ball that's about a half inch long and so if you periodically hear a funny noise in the background uh, this is a family studio and and Mac is having the time of his life throwing this little thing up in the air and chasing it so I'm just going to make that little disclaimer uh, he, he's very happy right now so I hope we can get through the presentation with you all right so let's begin with uh, verse 41 of chapter 4 this is where we left off it said many more believed because of Jesus word and they were saying to the woman it is no longer because of what you have said that we believe for we heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world and, and what that means is that as being non-Jewish as being religious people but not part of the Jewish culture Jesus came and ministered to them they are going to leave that two-day ministry experience with Jesus with a global picture of Jesus and I just need you to resonate with that for just a moment that the story of Jesus is to be spoken according to Revelation to every nation tribe tongue and people on this planet the Samaritans walk away from their first encounter with him with that beautiful picture of a global Christ ministering and saving the entire world savior of the world I hope becomes a phrase that never leaves your mind ever it is such a significant truth that they have just spoken because they were sitting at the very feet of Jesus so let's hang on to that truth that they are expressing that has been revealed in their encounter with him now let's go to verse 43 after the two days he went forth from there that's with the Samaritans into Galilee for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country so when he came to Galilee the Galileans received him having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast for they themselves also went to the feast verse 46 now please pay careful attention therefore he came to Cana of Galilee where he had made the water wine and there was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee he went to him and was imploring him to come down and to heal his son for he was at the point of death now you need to keep in mind that this invitation would be an overnight journey you're going to see that in the text here in just a moment that meant that Jesus would have to drop everything he was doing uproot the disciples change the plans for his ministry and head off and go to Capernaum so what's Jesus going to do verse 48 so Jesus said to him 
You know, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. In other words, the man believed that Jesus needed to be in the very presence of his son. But Jesus just spoke something profound. Do you have to see signs and wonders in order to believe? Prophecy talks about the deceptions that will come at the end of time with signs and wonders that will actually deceive may, maybe even the most elect. And he is simply stating here a caution in the present moment that reaches all the way down to the end of time. Do you have to see the spectacular to believe? That's what Jesus has just posed in that simple sentence hundreds of years ago for you and me right now to embrace an encounter. What do I have to see and know to believe? Do I need some spectacular manifestation in order to say yes to Jesus? That's an, a significant question of the gospel. Now let's move on to verse 49. The royal official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, Go. Now just think about this. Go. Your son lives. Now, this father had an opportunity to make a decision right here, right now, about what he believed to be the truth of Jesus. Is it going to have to be, Jesus, come heal my son right now? That's the original invitation. That was the request. Is that what it's going to be? But notice what John recorded here. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him <clears throat> Excuse me. And then he turned and headed home. The man believed. That concept of belief was action. The, the belief that the man embraced was the action that empowered him to turn and walk towards home knowing that Jesus had already acted on behalf of his request. Now that can have a profound impact on a person's prayer life, can't it? That can have a profound impact on everything we say and do every day in our lives. We come and we ask the Lord for things. When we get up and walk away, what is it that we actually believe? Do we pray for forgiveness and then three days later feel that we need to go back and repent of the same sins over and over? Do we ask and then get up and just walk away and act like, boy, you know, i got to keep asking. i got to ask a thousand times. How is it that Jesus honored the simple request of faith? And he said, go. And the man simply turned and walked away. <clears throat> Let's continue the story. Verse 51. As he was now going down, his slaves which means they left home, that they headed to meet the master. They met him, and with joy and excitement, I have no doubt that there was joy in this conversation, met him saying that his son was living. Now being a good father, verse 52, he inquired of them the hour. What time of day did he begin to get better? And they said to him, yesterday, about one o'clock, the fever left him. About the seventh hour. At sixth hour's noon, seventh hour would be about one o'clock in the afternoon. The fever left him. Now, isn't that an unusual question? So the father knew, notice this in, in, in verse 53. So the father knew that it was at that hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed, I, I might say he believed again, and his whole household was converted and became believers in Jesus. 
your son lives was spoken a day and a half away and those words which are echoes of creation remember Jesus we begin John said that there, everything that was ever made was made by him he was the agent of creation that Jesus is speaking the creative power of Genesis 1 and 2 and he speaks the word and that young man was healed of his illness. He himself, the father, and his entire household became believers in Jesus. Verse 54. This is again a second sign that Jesus performed when he'd come out of Judea into Galilee. That's a significant story. I want to close with this verse because this verse in John 3 set the tone for John 4. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So the question is, when does eternal life come to you? Whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him, shall not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 17, for God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but the world might be saved through him. We have such a conflict over the personality and character of Jesus in Christianity today. We have Christians who see Jesus as the authoritarian, angry God, and they go out in public and do the most brutal and unkind things to non-believers. But what does the Bible say? That Jesus did not come to be the judge, but to save the world, the Savior. Instead of holding placards up and, and saying horrible things to people, be it at an abortion clinic or be it at a funeral that's, or be it at a political rally, what would happen if corporate Christianity would embrace faith like this father who simply believed and a day and a half away his son was healed and that we would manifest that faith and that belief and that compassion of Christ to save the world everywhere we went would there not be a much more healthy positive response to God and to Christianity if it was manifested with the kind of faith that says the only way I know I was saved is because I believed in Christ and that becomes our mantra, that becomes our agenda. It's like the Samaritan woman, all Jesus cared about was, will she accept the Messiah? Can we as Christians lay aside all the other agenda aside for one single purpose, and that is to be able, like Jesus with the Samaritan woman, like Jesus with the royal official whose son was dying, can we manifest that simple confidence, do you believe? Will you believe? Can you believe that Jesus can manifest that healing power in the life? Jesus has begun to lay the foundation that it is our belief, and the word is is missing in my notes there, that it is our belief in him as the Son of God that provides all that we need in this present life to have salvation that we can say yes to Jesus no matter what the rest of the world thinks. And miracle happens in your heart right then, right there, in that hour, in that minute. It's that profound. It is that true. It is that simple. Closing picture. Sherry and I did a wedding at the country club up at Lake Tahoe and it was one of those late morning weddings and, you know, it's a little bit higher up on the mountain in altitude, so it was a little bit cool that morning. And there was such joy. Uh, this beautiful box that would just fit nicely in the hand with a lid on it was filled with these monarch butterflies. And you, you order these butterflies, and they're kept refrigerated until 
the wedding and when you let them warm up, they're supposed to open the lid and all fly away and have this lovely, beautiful moment in the wedding. And so this lovely, lovely bride opens this box to release the butterflies and it had been so cold that morning that they're just barely crawling out and peeking over the edge, trying to decide if it's quite warm enough to fly. And, and so Sherry, <clears throat> standing right there, had this marvelous moment just to capture the beauty of this moment. I hope you enjoy that. And by the way, I want you to know that everyone had a delightful time, even though it took the butterflies about another 30 minutes before they were up and flying around, which they finally did. But I just want to thank Sherry. She captures these precious moments for us. And I want you to know there was immense joy in that wedding, as there is immense joy in heaven when one person believes. A miracle happens in the human heart. I hope you have your miracle today. And I hope you share that miracle with another person. Blessings. Take care. Thank you, Sherry. See you again soon.